right, let's pop the cover off this unit and have a little look inside it. I've been a little bit busy with the screwdrivers. Now let's see what was in it, shall we? So the key component of the YAG laser is right there before your eyes. And it's simply that. That's all it is. Two mirrors and an ND YAG rod. Oh, and you might need a light bulb as well. Now we can see the xenon lamp in the water cooling jacket which pumps that rod full of photons. I am sure that most of you are aware that a laser is light amplification by a simulated emission of radiation. And this particular method of achieving that is done by an ND YAG rod, which is a man-made grown crystal, which is then cut and ground, as you can see. Which is neodymium doped yttrium aluminium garnet. That's quite a mouthful, but yttrium is spelt with a Y. So when we saturate this rod, with photons, they bounce about inside that rod. Some of them go straight down the end, bounce off a mirror, and go straight through the other end, bounce off a mirror, and then go straight to the other mirror, backwards and forwards, and at the same time we're stuffing it with even more light. This is called optical pumping. But if one of the mirrors is only partially reflective, the beam will come straight out the end of the mirror. Now you can see that is actually coated on the front surface of the mirror rather than the rear surface. So the light actually bounces off the front and it doesn't have to pass through the glass. Personally I find the biggest bugbear with lasers is actually aligning the mirrors to be exactly parallel with each other. That's always a tricky task, um, but sometimes you can use a smaller laser to pass through that rod just to help line up the two mirrors. These lasers can be pumped with power with very short sharp pulses and you can achieve hundreds of gigawatts of optical power output or you can run them at continuous wave. And naturally cooling the thing is a, a bit of a problem. It is important to keep it cool. Um, so let's look at the cavity in a bit more detail and the housing. There's the holder for the YAG rod itself. This is the xenon lamp with the YAG rod in its holder sitting in the cavity. But the cavity is really in a shocking state. So when that's all sealed up, like so, all that light in that tiny little box gets trapped and it's absorbed by that rod. This one seems quite an unusual design where the actual cavity and the rod and lamp are water cooled. Normally the cavity wouldn't be water cooled if there's a jacket around the lamp and the yag rod. But this one it is as you can see and it does look like we've had a bit of problem and there's some copper spewed out everywhere and that seems to be from this lamp holder which has had a loose connection and that's been a disaster. Um, I think that was in there look. And now we've got copper contaminated the water system. That's most unfortunate. Let's reassemble this a bit more so you can see it in detail. Well this is the burnt connection for the lamp holder which goes in there. Which has caused the problem. Can't even get that back in. There it is. These are water flow in and out. That's the other lamp holder. This YAG rod would normally have a cooling jacket around it as well, which water flows through it. I'm just going to insert this without the jacket so you can see it. I can get it in there. That's in there. There's the lamp in there. And then the cover on the top. And of course, that whole thing water flows all around this, which I think is a bad design, it's unnecessary, especially when you've got these flow tubes. I can't see what the point is of both, one or the other would do. Um, but hey ho, this one cools the actual cavity as well. Well you can probably get the picture now, this lamp and rod housing simply sits in this cradle, if I can get it in. Water cooling comes in from the bottom, 
goes in there, comes up through the bottom. Now we've got that in its cradle. One mirror goes in there, and of course you have a mirror at the other side. At both ends of the housing, you've got these fine adjustment screws, which you can adjust to keep the mirrors exactly parallel to each other. There's the adjusting screws the other end. They're very, very fine. The laser on this actually comes out the top by a fibre. So there's a small mirror here, which just chucks it upwards at 90 degrees. On this one there was a nice little helium neon strapped in there and that sent a small beam through two mirrors and it actually sent the beam straight down the yag rod itself so you could more or less see where your target was if it was lined up correctly of course. And these are the two mirrors that the uh, small laser was fired into and out of and back down the main rod and that was just simply on there like that. But I've removed that. Simple. These little things are known as bellows and they just cover up all the optics. And that couples up like that just to keep the dust out of any mirrors and keep it all nice and clean. On this laser, our mirrors are quite some distance away from the actual cavity. So we've got one in this housing, and we've got one in this housing. These rails, as you can see, are designed to keep the mirrors parallel to each other. Even when we've got expansion and contraction, it will expand and contract, still being parallel, which is naturally crucial for the laser to continue operating correctly. So basically all we was doing is bouncing light backwards and forwards between two mirrors and the photons in a nice parallel beam burst out of one end of the mirror in a nice straight line. The wavelength of this one was 1064 nanometers which is infrared. We, uh, well I was actually hoping to put a nice KTP crystal coupled up in this lot to get a nice 532 nanometer beam, but that wasn't going to happen, not with a state of that cavity. So unfortunately, we've just taken it apart and uh, hopefully learned a little bit of how they work. This is how the thing looks fully assembled and we can now see the helium neon laser on the side, just that small one, it's 5 to 15 milliwatts. And I think we should remove that and see if we can get the tube out of that housing intact without breaking it. So that should be quite challenging. Well, I thought I'd better record this before uh, we have a little accident. I'm trying to cut this helium neon tube or this laser out of this housing. But it's been sort of bonded in with some uh, sealant. So it's been a bit stubborn trying to get it out. If I can get this out whole and I can get it to work still. Well, it still works, but I have not got this thing out. This is proving very stubborn. Ah, oh, hallelujah. Got it out. How nice is that? One's quite a bit of voltage, though. Solder that back on there. One helium neon. And a tiny little power supply that runs on 12 volts. <laughs> yeah. That laser was quite bulky because of the water cooling system. As you can see down there, we've got a small reservoir tank, a couple of water filters, a circulator pump, a very large heat exchange, and a fan. Well, I think my computer needs that for when I'm editing, guys. What do you think? Perhaps not. 
This is the power supply that's required to run that small lamp. It's quite compact, so we have a detailed look at it. Oh, of course. Here's a quick shot at the front. Live in, neutral. This would be the third phase if we're using it. L1, L2, L3. But this is wired up single phase. The output's at the bottom. Wrong colours, I know. In this country, brown would be live, blue would be neutral. Um, that's quite deceptive because it is actually DC colours. Bit naughty, but we know what that is. This is our rectifier, three phase or single phase in, DC out, two capacitors in series. I think they're 200 volt, 10,000 microfarads each. We've got our rectifier unit and our IGBT transistors each side of that unit. The electronic modules there on that heatsink allow us to control the DC or run it with short, sharp pulses, or of course, continuous. Some heat sinks on the bigger lasers are water-cooled, but this one's air-cooled. There's the fan on the back of the unit. I think we've got a little choke underneath there, um, and a control board. Let's have a look the other side. Not much to it really, there's a few goodies in there worth having. I like that heat sink, it's fairly nice, air-cooled. So it's quite a nice compact power supply, but it is rather a lot just to run this tiny Xenon lamp. That's a lot of gear just to run that. But hey ho, that's electronics for you. As with any decent DC supply, one's going to need a decent mains filter. This one's 45 amps. That is quite a lump. They're quite expensive too, so I shall keep that. This is why I had dirty hands earlier guys. I've been fingering some high voltage stuff. Anyway, this little gadget in front of us develops a voltage, possibly six, seven hundred volts. This next little circuit board stores that, and with that SCR, this little thing, delivers a pulse of quite a few hundred volts into this trigger transformer, which is particularly nice, because our output from the power supply goes in here. This one goes off to the lamp, and if we stick 700 volts in this from that then our output is going to have an enormous spike on it which should ignite the lamp but hopefully if we can get enough voltage there is a particular lamp that it might just get going now there's an interesting thought if one of you good people want this helium neon laser there it is just put H-E-N-E -E in the comment and that means you want the laser. Of course, I can't guarantee that it will reach you without busting, but it does come with this small 12 volt power supply. So don't electrocute yourself because there's 5,000 volt that comes out of there. As usual, thanks for watching the vids. See you on the next one. There's plenty more coming up. Bye. This week's random winner for our giveaway on this Blackberry is Kurumi2. Well done. The phone is on its way.